Welcome everyone to the uh, Testicular Cancer Patient Education Symposium. My name is Richard McLean, and I'm hosting you today. Our first uh, speaker is Dr. Lori Wood. Uh, Dr. Wood is a medical oncologist at the Queen Elizabeth II Health Science Center in Halifax, as well as a uh, professor in the Department of Medicine at Dalhousie University with a cross appointment to the Department of Urology. Dr. Wood is a member of the GU disease site group and an active member of Cancer Care Nova Scotia. She is actively involved in phase two and phase three clinical, clinical, clinical trials uh, in GU ma ma malignancies with a specific clinical and research interest in renal cell carcinoma and testicular cancer. So I welcome her today. Thank you very much. My most important job description, I was saying, is actually a mom. And uh, that kind of takes priority. Is this me up here in this corner? Center one? Okay. So thank you for coming. And um, to the first, to second Testicular Cancer Canada Symposium, the first I understand was in Toronto last year. And uh, it's great. Uh, that we move the right direction out east. And uh, what I was going to do is start the morning off with just kind of um, some new data on uh, stage one testes cancer that's uh, just been uh, recently published. And it includes um, a subset of Canadian patients, which I thought was important to share. And um, so I just thought we'd start off the discussion by kind of some uh, straightforward definition. So instead of the word testicular cancer, by rights the proper term is germ cell tumors, because not all germ cell tumors actually start in the testicle. Probably about 95% or 90% do, but you can also have them start in other midline structures. So essentially kind of gonadal tissue starts when you're a ball, it descends downwards. So you can actually have germ cell tumors left behind or germ cell tissue left behind. So the tumors can start in the retroperitoneum or the mediastinum or in this area as well. So we tend to say testicular cancer, but really they're germ cell tumors. So, and probably in the audience, people know that there's two main pathologies. One is non-seminoma, one is seminoma, and then you can often have mixed tumors. Under the non-seminoma, there's different subtypes there that uh, you can read, but embryonal, choriocarcinoma, yolk sac tumor, and teratoma. In terms of staging, as a medical oncologist, it's actually really easy to think of. So stage one is the testicles only. Stage two is if it's in the lymph nodes, which are, we call the retroperitoneal lymph nodes, which is where the normal lymphatic drainage would be of the testicles. And stage three is if it's anywhere else. So fairly easy to remember. And stage one treatment options, uh, which is what we're going to focus on today, for the non-seminoma and the seminoma, you can see there that surveillance is the mainstay in North America. And that's because the majority of stage one testes cancer do not recur. And so we tend to watch them, which I'm not going to go into in detail right now because that's going to be the remainder of the talk. The other options for stage one non-SEM would be a primary retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. So removing all of the lymph nodes in the normal drainage location where we know they tend to go. The third option, which we tend not to do a lot in Canada and, and the US, is uh, two cycles of chemotherapy. And kind of our old literature was about 20 to 25 percent of all stage one non-SEM come back. So if you survey them, 75 percent of the time they will not come back, 20 to 25 percent they will. With seminoma, the list is very similar, except instead of surgery, you would do radiation instead. And a few less recur in the range of 15 to 20 percent is kind of what we used to quote uh, patients. So in terms of how we survey stage one patients, um, history and physical exam, tumor markers, um, which we'll talk about in a second, imaging, so either of the, uh, of the chest with either a plain chest x-ray or a CT, and then the CT of the abdomen and pelvis. Um, sometimes that may be moving towards MRI scans, um, and in fact the British are doing a study looking at MRIs instead of CAT scans, but the key is you can't get away with ultrasounds, you need something more than that. It's more frequent in the first two years and then less after, and it's a real balance between enough staging investigations to, uh, or surveying investigations to make sure you're not going to miss anything, but at the same time not doing too many so that we uh, avoid the toxicity of radiation uh, exposure and anxiety. 
So this table one is kind of a summary of surveillance guidelines if you combine all the guidelines. And one of the problems is there's a lot of guidelines across the world. So there's American guidelines, Canadian guidelines, provincial guidelines, um, UK guidelines, European guidelines. So we've tried to kind of put them all together in one table here. And you can see that in some of them, doing tumor markers in year one would vary between six and 12 times a year, depending on which guideline. Physical exam between six and 12 times a year. A CT abdo pelvis would be two to four times a year. And chest x-rays anywhere from zero to 12 times a year. And you can just see as you go out towards year five, all of those things decrease in frequency. So that's again a summary of everything that's out there so far. So this is some new data that was just published, and uh, the authors at the bottom there, it's, uh, the lead author is Christian Kohlmansberger, who's actually a fantastic GU medical oncologist in Vancouver. He's originally from Germany and now in uh, Vancouver, and uh, very well published in this area. So they looked at it, almost 2,500 patients with stage one uh, germ cell tumors, and it's a fairly recent cohort. If you look at some of the literature in, in testes cancer, it's from 1980. So this is really nice to have a new cohort of patients. About a five-year follow-up, and multiple centers and multiple countries represented, represented, and from Canada, again, it was um, BC and Toronto. And so uh, 1,100, about 1,100 had non-SEM, and about 1,300 had seminoma. So this is modern-day numbers. 19% of uh, non-SEMs relapse compared to 13% of seminomas. So a little bit less than what we would quote, were quoting patients before, which is obviously great news. And if you look with non-seminoma, one of the most important prognostic features is something called LVI. And LVI means lymphovascular invasion. So in the testes specimens, you actually see the tumor in blood vessels around the tumor in the testicle. And if you have that, your risk of recurrence is higher. So in fact, it's 44%. If you don't have that, it's 14%. And as we mentioned for seminoma, it was 13%. And what this article shows is the time to relapse is different depending on which of those subtypes you have. So for seminoma, it's just over a year. So what we call the median means half of people are less than that number, half of people are more than that, that number. So 14 months, half of people less for seminoma, half of people more. For non-SEM, if it was in, your, in, the two, in the blood vessels, the LVI positive, it was four months. So you tended to recur quite quickly. If it didn't have it in the blood vessels, it was a bit later at eight months. But still, you can see that most by a year. Um, and this is timing of relapses in those that relapsed. So if you're going to relapse, if you're one of those 14%, and again, when I put up the LVI, the 82% is underneath that. Out of all the stage one non-SEM tumors, 82% did not have lymphovascular invasion, so fell into the better risk category. 72% of them, it came back within a year. 89% of them within two years. 93% within three years. And only 7% recurred after three years of the ones that relapsed. If you actually take all comers with stage one in that column, less than 1% of all patients relapsed after three years, which is obviously great news from an uh, education counseling point of view that we can give patients and their families. If you had lymphovascular invasion positive, in fact, more recurred within the first three years, 98%, and it was rare to recur after three years. And again, out of all comers, it was less than 1%. For seminoma, 92% happened within the first three years, but you can see compared to non-SEM that definitely more happened between year two and three. And why this has implications, again, is how we follow um, these young men. So in terms of how you pick up relapses, so you know we do the markers, we examine you, we uh, do the scans. So if you had no lymphovascular invasion, you were a non-SEM, 48% of the times it was picked up on the CT scan of the abdomen, 41% of the time by tumor markers. Interestingly, chest x-ray didn't pick up um, recurrences anybody. An interesting physical exam, only 1%. Um, if it was in your... Um, uh, blood vessels, so lymphovascular invasion positive, there were more people that were picked up by tumor markers. And again, very low yield with the chest x-rays and the physical exam. And with seminoma, almost all are picked up on the scans. The, if you relapse, the important thing about the surveillance is there's good data out there that if you're a stage one seminoma and you're on surveillance, or seminoma or non-sem, if you're on surveillance and you relapse, you have a very, very high chance of cure. And in fact, the chance of curing you is just as good as if you got treated up front, which is why we tend to survey people to avoid treatment. 
And if you relapse, we want you to relapse to what we call good risk. So IGCCG stands for International Germ Cell Consensus Group. And basically, this takes people and divides them into three groups. And you, if you're going to relapse, you want to relapse as a good risk. And 90% did and 99% was seminoma. So only 2% and 0% relapsed as poor risk, which is obviously not what we want. We don't want anyone to relapse, but especially in terms of poor risk. And how, how you define those essentially is good risk patients are patients where you, your primary was in the testicle, where if it comes back, it's only in lymph nodes or lungs, and your tumor markers are relatively low. Poor risk is if it comes back and it's in organs like the liver, the bone, or your tumor markers are really high. And I just realized I didn't talk about the tumor markers for germ cells, so everybody in the audience would know and probably uh, those watching. So the unique thing about testicular cancer, germ cell tumors, is that you have uh, blood tests that uh, show up in a lot of patients with disease, and that's something called an alpha fetoprotein and a beta HDG. And we know exactly which tumors produce which one, so it, it lets us guide um, um, surveillance very well. Non-seminoma has a much higher likelihood of having tumor marker elevation than seminoma, which is why on that previous screen we picked up more seminomas with CT imaging than tumor markers. So normally I would ask for questions in between as I go along, but since we're filming this for uh, posterity's sake, we'll, ask, we'll have questions at the end. So obviously we don't want any patients with any cancer to pass away, and certainly not with testes cancer. And these numbers are um, very good, although not 100%. So from non-seminoma, 97% are alive with no evidence of cancer, with seminoma, 99%. Three patients with non-sem passed away of cancer, zero with seminoma. You can see a few patients, unfortunately, did die of treatment, and then some patients died of other causes. So in oncology, we use the term disease-specific survival. What are your chances of surviving with no evidence of cancer, as opposed to other causes? And it's 99.4% with non-SEM and 100% with seminoma, which obviously the non-SEM we'd like to be 100%, but that's uh, certainly better than uh, every other cancer that we treat. So conclusions from this data are essentially we want to ensure that there's enough visits and scans to pick up recurrences, but we certainly don't want to increase anxiety and exposure to radiation with too many visits, and we certainly don't want to harm people. This data shows that the yield of doing any abdominal imaging with CT scan and things is probably after three years fairly small, and maybe for non-SEM even after two years. A CT pelvis is probably not needed because, again, we know exactly where the lymph nodes go and the, or the tumor would go in the lymph node drainage, and it really is the abdomen, not the pelvis. And CT pelvic imaging does increase your exposure a bit. You need one in the very beginning to make sure um, everything's okay, and you probably do need some CT pelvises uh, depending on if you'd had prior inguinal surgery or pelvic surgery before your diagnosis. And CT chest imaging is probably not warranted, and you can get away with a chest X-ray, which again decreases radiation exposure. So based on this data, the authors actually proposed a new strategy for surveillance. And uh, it's a fairly busy slide, but um, basically physical exam every two months for year one with tumor markers every two months, a chest X-ray at 4, 8, and 12. And the authors did state that there wasn't agreement on whether chest X-rays were really needed or not because we showed that the pickup was low with it, but at the same time it's fairly low um, risk. And then CT abdomen imaging at 4, 8, and 12. You can see that at year three it decreases, as, and as you go down to year six, it's physical exam and tumor markers every six months, or, um, and then actually no imaging. You can see the stars at 36 months and 60 months there, and again, that was no complete agreement in whether you really need scans at the end of year three and the end of year five. Intuitively, that's what we used to do because in the old days, we were reassured the more scans we did, we felt better about it, we could give you good news, uh, but again, maybe we don't need those. And then for seminoma, because seminoma tends to uh, recur a bit later, tends to be slower if it is going to come back, and we can't use markers quite as much, they're not as reliable. The follow-up schedule is a little bit different and actually a little bit less intensive than non-seminoma. And the scans are a little bit more between years two and three because of the, based on the data that I showed you that there are actually more recurrences with seminomas year, between year two and three than non-seminoma. And um, Testicular Cancer Canada Medical Advisory Board, we in fact just had a teleconference this week, one of the things they're looking on is whether we can have a Canadian-wide standard on follow-up guidelines or surveillance guidelines for stage one tumors, and it's something that I think going forward we'll be looking at and talking about when we have an in-person meeting in June, and there are people leading this initiative. 
So in Nova Scotia, since we're here in Nova Scotia, we, um, we modified our guidelines in 2011 and we modified them based on a trial that came out of the UK that looked for stage one non-SEM, whether you could get away with two scans instead of five scans in the first two years. And it was a very well-designed trial. What they found, though, is that they, um, just by chance, 90% of their patients were low-risk patients. So it really, this may not apply to high-risk patients, with, again, high-risk being lymphovascular invasion positive. So when we made our guidelines in 2011, we actually decided on two different follow-up strategies, whether you were, uh, had lymphovascular invasion or not. Um, interestingly, these authors didn't divide it up that way, um, but it may be something that needs to be looked at was seminoma, and I spelt it wrong there, sorry you guys. Uh, the guidelines, our Nova Scotia guidelines are actually the original ones from 2002. So those definitely need to be looked at again, and uh, in fact we just talked about it a few weeks ago at a GU site team meeting that we'll need to. But I think using this data that was just published will be helpful. And again, if we can have a Canada-wide guideline, the things we've learned about you young guys with testes cancers, you don't tend to stay in one place. So you're all over the country, and so it would be nice if you knew what was happening depending on what center you went to, that, uh, that it would be relatively the same. So maybe I'll just stop there, and uh, I don't know if we want questions at this point. Is that okay? Um, so I don't know if there's any questions from the audience. Jonathan. Did you mention that the, most of the previous cohorts have been from the 80s, as well as the more recent one? Was there uh, Oh, we're going to ask a question with the mic. Sorry. <laughs> you mentioned that... Um, most of the previous cohorts have been from the 80s, um, somewhere in that time frame. This one was more recent. Uh, was there, um, you know, I guess decade over decade improvement in terms of survival rates and that type of thing? So the recurrence, yeah, so again, the great thing is stage one testes cancer has actually always done well. So if one series has 98%, another has 99.4, is that a big difference? It's actually hard to say. So that's the good thing. What you can definitely see is, though, the amount of imaging that we were doing and surveillance that we were doing has definitely decreased over the years with no dec uh, decrease in outcome. So that's really the good thing. Um, some of the biggest population-based studies, because that's what you really need if you're looking at true outcomes, what you don't want is, you know, you could argue maybe BC and Toronto have the best outcomes in all of Canada. Um, I don't think so, but let's just say that. Um, then if you only include their data, you're biasing and you'll have potentially better results. So what you really need for outcome data is population-based um, um, registries. And um, Scandinavian countries have great data on that. So a lot of the data that you'll see called Swinatika, I don't know if anybody's ever read that, but it stands for Sweden and Norway. Every testes patient gets entered into a registry and followed for life. So those kind of population-based outcomes are, are the, the best for, for trying to decide what's happening over time. And outcomes are improving over time, but as they are for most cancers. Any other questions, Nick? Uh, I had a question, and it, it's actually repeating a question that was given to me by one of the patients. When I'm quoting them these numbers about, you know, it's the first two years, perhaps three, for salmonoma that it's really risky, and then after that, your risk drops off precipitously. Right. And the question was, because uh, currently we follow our non-salmonoma patients for five years, and salmonoma patients out to 10 years, uh, we're quite conservative. So they said, why do I have to come back all of the, those years? And uh, I think that leads into sort of the rest of the talks today, looking at sort of survivorship issues. Um, and managing those as well, but the, it, I pose the question to you. Yeah, and uh, so the, again, how long should we follow up in what venue? And, you know, there's been a lot of work done in other cancers, probably breast the most. Do you need your follow-up at a cancer center, or can your family physician follow you just as well, for example? And um, they found that with breast cancer that the follow-up, the outcomes are the same, and in fact, anxiety isn't any more. There's probably a small subset that would prefer to be at the cancer center, and there's definitely a subset that would prefer to be with the family doc immediately. Um, but I don't think outcomes have been shown to be worse. The thing with testes cancer, and I think why we've always kept them in a cancer center is because it's one of the few cancers that if it does recur, you can cure it. Most cancers, when they come back, that's actually not an option. Uh, sometimes it is, but testes cancer, we would definitely go for the gusto no matter what, the second time, the third time, the fourth time. And so that's, I think, one of the other reasons historically. 
To be honest, as a medical oncologist, and maybe it's selfish, I really like to see you guys. If I have a clinic and I see two of you guys in the clinic and I can see your smiling faces and you bring in your kids and you bring in your wife, it actually makes my day because, uh, you know, it, you, you have such great outcomes. And so knowing you help people and seeing that you're leading productive lives is a great thing. Um, but from a public health point of view, could they be, could Chesty's patients be transferred to the family physician? Family physicians would obviously need to be educated in things like that. I know Toronto has a, a, a kind of more of a survivorship clinic that Chesty's patients get shifted into a little bit. Um, we don't have that in Nova Scotia. I don't know if other provinces do. Um, so that would be another way to do it. It's not necessarily, you could have a great nurse practitioner running that clinic that would help deal with the other issues like anxiety and stuff that comes up probably better than physicians can. So it's certainly something that could be looked at. Patients, and again, sometimes we assume patients want to come to the cancer center, right? So the other thing is just simply asking them. A lot of 19-year-old guys don't have a relationship with their family doctor or don't have a family physician at all or in university in a totally different city. So they'd prefer the cancer center more because of logistics. Others that have a great relationship with their family doctors may prefer that. So the other big key is ask patients. Anything else? Okay, Richard, maybe I'll turn it back over to you.